Do you avoid stocks because you find them too risky? Or maybe you have been burned in the past, losing a lot of your investment. In a previous video, we discussed risk and showed examples of professional investors worth billions that still manage to get broke because they don't understand risk. These investors use high-risk leveraging, which can't compare to the risk associated with investing in a normal stock. Still, there is some risk associated with every company. There are many examples of huge companies with market dominance that either went bankrupt or became shadows of its former glory. Given this knowledge, is there any safe way to invest with a great prospect and a very low associated risk? If any company can go bankrupt, how can you ensure that you don't lose your money? One way to reduce risk and keep a substantial part of the potential upside is index funds. Not only are they much less risky than the average stock, but index funds also beat most mutual funds and hedge funds for a fraction of the cost. In this video, we'll explain index funds and why this is the safest and cheapest way to invest in stocks. Welcome to Investing in a Nutshell, the channel where we explain the world of investing so that you can learn and start your own journey as an investor. It's important to know and acknowledge that any company can go bankrupt. It might seem impossible, but unexpected incidents can occur. New competitors might arise or new innovations introduced that make the product this company creates obsolete. Stocks represent the market's valuation of the company, and therefore a company might survive, but the stock value could be much, much lower than when you bought it. There are also countless examples of companies that borrowed too much debt, and only managed to survive by issuing a huge number of new shares for the creditors, leaving the original stock owners with breadcrumbs of the company. Let's examine some examples of companies that were the king on the rock and then became shadows of its former glory. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was very popular to use disposable cameras. Each camera had a roll of negatives that could capture 20 to 30 pictures. After you had taken all the pictures, you would extract the roll of negatives and throw away the camera. Kodak owned the market for disposable cameras, but was not able to keep pace with innovation. Enter the digital camera, the solution that brought you much better quality, and you didn't have to buy a new camera all the time. In fact, the price per picture came down to zero. The only cost became the camera itself. The stock lost an average of 30% each year, from 1999 till 2013, and then it went bankrupt. Nokia had the best cell phones in the 90s and the early 2000s. Everyone I knew owned a Nokia. In 2007, they still had a 50% global market share in cell phones after dominating the market for 10 years. How could anyone beat Nokia? Enter the iPhone. And as they say, the rest is history. The stock is still to date down more than 90% from its peak in the early 2000s. In the 50s and 60s, IBM was the undisputed king of computers. It had troubles in the 70s, but got back in the game in the 80s with a leading market share. But how many people do you know now that owns an IBM computer? IBM has fared better than Nokia and Kodak, but the stock price has only increased 10% since we entered this millennia. It's difficult to say which sector will have the next technological revolution, but it seems like the auto market might be a hot candidate. Electric vehicles are on the rise, beating the old internal combustion engines on every metric. Soon electric cars will even be cheaper to buy than a gasoline car. The old companies in the sector are Ford, GM, Stellantis, Volkswagen, Toyota, and Honda. The challengers are Tesla, BYD, Lucid, Rivian, and a lot of Chinese startups. We'll cover a deep dive into Tesla as an investment in a future video. So make sure to subscribe to the channel and press the like button. It really helps out the channel. It enables us to reach more people and help them start their investment journeys. Our point with these examples is to show that any company and its stock is associated with risk. You can't know which companies that will thrive for the next 10 years and which companies that will perish. So how do you avoid the risk but still benefit on the amazing returns of the stock market? That's where our index fund comes into play. There are many different categories of funds. Mutual funds, hedge funds, index funds, and more. What they all have in common 
is the fact that they invest in several assets. An asset can be a single stock, bond, currency, or even crypto. They do this to diversify their portfolio, which in turn will reduce the risk. Mutual funds are managed by professional investors. They will invest with their clients' money and choose which companies they believe will have a high stock market return in the short or long term. Mutual funds can usually pick stocks from many different market indexes and create a mix between technology stocks from NASDAQ, a couple of giants from the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and a bunch of small companies from the Russell 2000. There's a mechanism for grouping a set of stocks that we refer to as a market index. Take the S&P 500, for instance. It's a collection of the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the U.S. The companies listed on the market index will not have the same size. And by size, we refer to the market value. Bigger companies need to be a larger part of the index and should impact the index more than a small company. Apple, for instance, has a market value above $2 trillion. And DaVita has a market value of $6 billion. If DaVita's stock increases 10% in a day, it can't make the same dent in the index as when Apple rises 1%. The market index solves this challenge by assigning a stock weight to each stock, where the weight is the company's market cap as a percentage of the entire market cap of all companies in the index. The weight is calculated after each trading day. We know this might be a lot to process. Rewatch the video if you're confused, and it'll make sense. Now that we've covered what a market index is, we can finally explore the topic of today's video, the index fund. An index fund is created to match the performance of the underlying market index. The index fund will buy stocks from all the companies listed in the market index in accordance with the stock weight. That way, the index fund will track the market index closely. If someone were to create an index following the S&P 500 now with $1 million as starting capital, it would need to buy $65,000 of Apple stock, $55,000 in Microsoft stock, and follow the weight of each stock down the entire list. It's easy to think that an index fund must perform loads of trades every day, since it is supposed to keep up with the weight of all stocks based on the index. But that's not the case. Imagine that an index fund has bought all companies according to the stock's weight in the index. A new trading day passes, and some stocks go up, and some stocks go down. At the end of the day, new weights are assigned. The weights will be different than the day before, but the index does not need to perform any trades because their stocks in each company had the same performance as the market, and they had the same distribution of stocks as the market index. An index fund will only need to make trades in four scenarios. When new investors want to invest in the index, increasing the total value of the index fund. When existing investors pull money out of the index, decreasing the total value of the index fund. When companies pay dividends, resulting in fresh money for the index fund that must be invested. If new companies are added or existing companies are removed from the index, Luckily, this will only happen a few times a year at the same time as the changes made in the market index. In essence, an index fund will invest in a set list of stocks according to the company's market cap. The index fund will therefore spread your investments across all these companies, reducing your risk. An index fund can only go bankrupt if all the underlying companies are bankrupt. And if that happens, we have much bigger problems to handle. We recommend investing in index funds as a preferred alternative to mutual funds. Index funds typically have much lower costs than mutual funds. The average index fund has a cost of just 0.3%, while the average mutual fund charges 1.5%. This can make a huge difference over the long term, since the average historical return in the stock market is about 10% a year. To prove our point, Warren Buffett made a million-dollar bet back in 2008. He bet that nobody could pick a mutual fund that would outperform a low-cost S&P 500 index fund over the next 10 years. Only one person took the bet, putting together a hedge fund consisting of five mutual funds. In those 10 years, we had a global financial crisis. Banks and companies went bankrupt, and the housing market almost collapsed. Surely the mutual funds could beat a passive index fund in this time period. 
the index fund managed to get 85% return in the 10 years, beating every single one of the mutual funds. The best mutual fund managed to grow 63%, and the worst increased a mere 3% in 10 years. The average result of the hedge fund consisting of the five mutual funds only increased 22%. The index did not only beat the mutual funds, but it also smashed it. Index funds have a great track record, have low fees, and they're easy to find and invest in. There's an index fund for most investment styles in the stock market. If you want to track the S&P 500, there's an index named SPY. If you prefer the technology sector, then check out QQQ. Maybe you want to invest in small cap companies. Then IJR could be an option for you. Find a sector you believe in and start investing. We hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you have any question or comment, we love your feedback. We read all your comments. Have a great day and good luck on your own investment journey.